Teacher's Notes for the Autumn Term, price £1.95, and the Pupil's Book Introducing CDT, price £4.50, please contact your local ITV company. Alternatively, send a cheque or postal order to Schools Publications Office, Thames Television, 149 Tottenham Court Road, London, W1P 9LL. <laughs> visit a playground, it's the movement that gives you the greatest thrill. You can swing from a pole, like a pendulum. You can let gravity whiz you down to earth from the top of a slide. Some of us enjoy feeling dizzy as we swing round on a roundabout. Roundabouts in fairgrounds, or merry-go-rounds, use the same motion. They rotate on a central point. It was so exciting, you wanted to go on the rides, and when you were standing down on the ground, they looked as if they were having such a good time, you just wanted to get up there so fast and have a go yourself and see how you felt. For centuries, travelling fairs and their rides have brought thrills and make-believe into the farthest corners of the country, starting at a time when there were few other entertainments. The appeal of the rides was uh, twofold. One, that you did things on those rides that you wouldn't normally do in your everyday life. You know, it uh, appealed to the daredevil in people. And secondly, you were able to do things like, say, ride a horse, which you couldn't do normally. Travelling fair arrives on your doorstep once a year and rather like the conjurer's trick, rather like the rabbit being pulled out of the hat, the fair suddenly appears. Just think of the sheer spectacle and magic as bits of wood and canvas and machinery are taken out of the backs of lorries and are transformed into hoopla, side stalls and roundabouts. And just as quickly when the fair is over, they disappear. One night they're there, the next morning they're gone. The job of building up a ride like a waltzer involves all the family. At first, the heavy machinery which okay. turns the ride must be made level. Travelling rides, by their very nature, have to be easy to construct. They have to be lightweight, they have to be portable. As a result, you will find that most travelling rides consist largely of wood with little metal. Metal is heavy, it is cumbersome to move around. Even so, a ride has to have some metal. The girders, for example. But the platform on top is wood. Wood is a more sympathetic material. It is an organic material which responds to the movement of the machine and is probably more able to withstand the sort of tensions that a ride is subjected to. A showman has to be not only a jack of all trades, but he has to be a master of all trades. He has to be his own engineer, he has to be his own uh, painter and decorator, he has to be his own transport manager. You name it, he has to do it. The basic uh, shape of a ride, of necessity, has to be circular, something that turns round. It, it is, in a sense, a wheel. Like a roundabout, the platform of a waltzer rotates from the middle. But there's another thrill too. Each car rotates on its own axis. The cars are fixed from a central pivot, 
which is secured onto the platform with a strong nut and bolt. They put in a large pin to make sure the bolt doesn't loosen as the cars rotate. When the platform tilts over, gravity helps set the cars spinning. The most thrilling part of the ride of the walls comes when, after lazily uh, turning round, that car suddenly starts to spin, and it is that acceleration which gives you the thrill. And the world says, I felt sick, but I liked the way it was spinning around. It seemed like you were just in one place. You could hear everybody screaming. It was just great fun. When we were on the because it went so fast, you felt safe because you were pinned back to the seat. And you could spin it around yourself, which I liked as well. That feeling of being pinned back in your seat is what you might get in a spin dryer. It's a centrifugal force which throws you outwards as you spin. Where does the power come from to push the ride round? In the old days, they used horses, but nowadays, fairgrounds can generate their own electricity in big diesel lorries. The moment that you were able to mechanize a roundabout, you were able to make it larger, more heavily ornamented, and you were able also to start varying the actual nature and design of the ride. Fairground rides have to be easy to dismantle and build up, but that's not the case for rides in a fixed amusement park. They may not have the same magic, but the rides can be bigger and some say better. You'll still see the same movement as in your local playground. When you buy your tickets, you are paying for an afternoon of certain fear. The roller coaster, for instance, moves at nearly 40 miles an hour. The difference really is that the amusement parks in this country have the big permanent rides, give people the better thrill. But they're much, much bigger. They're much heavier. The construction, the metalwork is far heavier because it has to withstand more day-to-day -day use. For instance, the big roller coaster has a tank of water to hold it on the ground. It must hold at least 30,000 gallons of water. Whereas if you had a lighter roller coaster which would travel around the fairgrounds, it could not have the thrills that this particular ride has had. I went on the Python and my head was being knocked around a lot and I wasn't too sure about that because it's a bit scary. Well, the man in charge likes to discuss the rides with his customers. Safety harnesses yeah, which stopped kept, coming out. Yeah, our heads kept knocking around. We bought around. the Python because it was designed to be the smallest looping roller coaster in the world. <laughs> the car is moved forward by a small tyre underneath the cars and then rolled down under its own gravity to the very long hill which has got the chain on, taken to the top of the hill, and then from there, the car is completely free of any outside forces, just pure gravity. Because it's a small ride, it has the four main elements all in the ride. The drop, the turn, the loop, and the speed, which everybody wants in a roller coaster. 
but when you turn upside down, you don't really notice. But on the way back down, you can just see the rails, and your belly feels like it's turning round and round. The reason people don't fall out of the python is because when going through the loop, which is possibly the most dangerous part of the ride, the G-force is pressing against the circle of the loop, presses you against the seat. The G-forces keep you in. So how is the car brought to a stop at the end? There's a metal plate underneath, which is gripped automatically by special brakes on the track. They work by compressed air. The operator's job is simply to start the car rolling. The rest of the control is done by computer sensors that detect the speed and can bring the brakes into action to slow a car down or stop it if there's a problem. Other rides use computers even more. For example, this parachute drop. On the power tower, when you got to the top and then it jolted, you felt as if it was going to leave you behind and you thought you were going to fall out. The thrill of this ride is the feeling of free fall as you begin the descent. Computers have made a lot of difference to a ride that has to be controlled every time exactly the same. For instance, the power tower quite literally could not be manually operated by a member of our staff because the descent has to be controlled to set speed, the number of times that the ride is raised up and released the number of times the drum goes round through all the safety devices that are installed. A man physically could not do that, so a computer is the only way of operating that ride. The new technology, which is mainly computer controlled rides or microchip controlled rides, they ensure that every customer has exactly the same ride as the previous customer and when they come back again they will have the same sort of ride each time they come. Even the swing boat is automatically controlled. It may look like a playground swing but it's far too big to be pushed. The boat is curved at the bottom. It's moved by two tires, which spin in opposite directions. As the bottom of the boat passes over them, the tires are raised by special motors, so they push the boat away. That's why it swings like a pendulum. As the tire is brought up to the bottom of the boat, the right-hand tire, for instance, would be going anti-clockwise, touching the keel and flick the boat and start it to move. Then that tire would go down out of the way, the second tire would come in and flick the boat in the opposite direction. The frame is made out of welded construction, steel girders of at least 48 feet high, and that is about three and a half tons in weight. If you open your eyes, you thought that you were gonna fall out so if you close your eyes, it helps you to think you weren't going to fall out. You wouldn't be able to see what happens. I didn't feel very safe on the pirate ship because it went up so high that I just think you could have slipped over the bar and fell out. That is gravity pulling you down into your seat, although you do feel weightlessness due to the sharp rise in the boat but it's the G-forces, or the gravity forces, pulling you down to the ground. On a well-designed ride, G-force, or gravity, can be used to give us thrills without danger to life and limb. Fun fairs like playgrounds have their risks. The challenge is to provide the thrill without the danger. If I was going to design a fair ride, I'd have to make something high, because I like height, because it's so frightening when you look down and um, steep hills and things. If it was going to be a roller coaster, big loops and steep hills, because they're, they're the most sort of um, scary. I like being scared. I think it's exciting. 